It's time to talk about water and surface area, cell surface area. That's the two topics in this uh, section of the uh, matter and energy unit. So water is a really kind of unusual compound because it's really tiny, but it's also really polar. Um, living things absolutely depend on water, not just for their sustenance, but they need the properties of water uh, that come from its polarity and its hydrogen bonding to survive. Uh, it turns out hydrogen atoms in water have a uh, partial positive charge, and that's because uh, the molecule doesn't have um, equally shared electrons in the covalent bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen. So in H2O, we have H-O-H. The pair of electrons between the O's and the H's is not shared equally, and as a result, the hydrogens uh, are a little naked and the oxygens are a little heavy on electron clothing. This makes the proton of the hydrogen exposed so the hydrogens become partially positive, the oxygen is partially negative. That's what is the basis of water's polarity. That allows water molecules to bond up uh, with other four other water molecules at once uh, and as a result of that the molecules form like uh, matrices, essentially, when, especially when they freeze. Water is one of the weird materials that actually expands when it freezes. I mean, people take that for granted, but that's so weird. Most, almost every other substance on Earth shrinks when it forms a solid. You get smaller when your molecules stop moving. You don't get bigger. Water gets bigger, which um, it's life-saving, but at the same time, if your hands freeze, the expansion of the water in your cells causes your cells to rupture and your cells die as a result, which is a serious side effect of this expansion, uh, kind of a, a, a downer. Anyway, water molecules are cohesive to one another, breaking re and reforming uh, hydrogen bonds many times per second. Uh, we call this cohesion. Water molecules sticking to one another is cohesion. Water molecules sticking to other molecules is called adhesion. Um, the cohesion allows water molecules to exhibit what we call surface tension. Surface tension is the resistance of a surface to breakage. And it's pretty high for water, considering water is such a tiny little molecule. If you look at the water striders down here, they're standing on the water. And that's because water has a surface tension. If you put some soap in the water, the water striders stink. Oh, it's not stink. The water striders will sink in the water and drown. By the way, that's water striders are actually kind of a healthy sign on a creek. If uh, any raw sewage is getting into a creek, there will be soaps in the water, people doing laundry and whatever, and those will cause the water to lose its surface tension and the water striders will sink and drown. So water has a very high specific heat due to this cohesion, and that means that it holds its heat well. Uh, because of hydrogen bonding, bonding evaporation uh, requires large amounts of energy, which is a great thing to cool yourself on the, on the downer side. If you're wearing jeans and it's really cold outside, the evaporation of the water from your legs could give you hypothermia because the evaporation does suck a lot of energy out of your body as it happens. Water's evaporation requires 580 calories per gram. That's pretty high. For every gram of water that's got to evaporate, it's going to have to pull 580 grams of calories um, of energy. Keep in mind that, that, that that's, a, that's a high number for such a small molecule. So uh, it turns out water vapor in the air moderates temperatures, especially on hot summer days. In Missouri, it would get much hotter if it wasn't for the water vapor in the air. Go west into Kansas, temperatures in Colorado, temperatures can go over 100, but here in Missouri we're sweltering at 97 because of the humidity in the air. Um, uh, ice floats on liquid water, which is totally weird, and water's maximum densely, density is actually not when it's frozen, but when it's 40 degrees Fahrenheit or 4 degrees Celsius. That is such a weird property. So ice is about 10% less dense than water at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the ice frozen on the surface of the lake actually insulates the water below. Now, this, there's something important to mention here, and I see it every spring and fall in my neighborhood where I have lakes. When water at the surface of a lake hits 40 degrees, 
the whole lake will do what is called turn over. If you look at a lake from the side, if we consider a lake a big basin, here's the water surface. When the water at the surface hits 40, the whole lake can mix and the entire lake will turn brown and muddy as muddy water from the bottom rises to the top. But once the water at the surface of the lake in the summertime is warmer than 40, water that's 50, 60, 70, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that's less dense and it wants to float. It's like helium balloons. It wants to float up to the surface. So at that point in the summertime, the upper part of the lake doesn't mix with the lower part of the lake because this is lighter and this is heavier. So down here can actually lose all of its oxygen. The big fish, they're all in the upper 10 to 15 feet of water. The bottom of the lake gets no exchange during the summer and the, the bottom of the lake has no big fish in it because they'll suffocate. Now in the fall, when the temperature of the lake falls to 40, let's go to a different color. Let's choose red. When the lake gets to 40 again now, in the fall, the whole lake mixes again, all right? Now, in the, as you approach winter, lake, the surface of the lake will go down to 32. At that point, it freezes. But then it's back to like summer, because, not temperature-wise, but density-wise. The 32-degree water here is lighter than the water below. So as a result, it floats. And when the water freezes, it still floats. It stays up on the surface of the lake. This keeps the lake from freezing solid. If you take a typical like other liquid like gasoline, acetone, ethanol, methanol, naphtha, and you start freezing them from the outside, when the surface freezes, the pieces fall to the bottom and they continue the freezing process down there and the whole thing freezes, freezes solid. That obviously would be a catastrophe for a lake for it to freeze solid. This doesn't happen though because water has this freakazoid property of being lighter when it's a solid than when it's a liquid, which is, again, a very strange thing for a compound. This is how nonpolar things don't like to mix with water. Water is cohesive enough to form perfectly round droplets on the surface of, this is a lily pad here, on a uh, pond. This water droplet here is repelled from the nonpolar wax on the surface of the leaf and the water molecules want to stick to one another and they form a ball. This is showing each water molecule and how they're hydrogen bonded to each other. The O's can actually bond to at least two other hydrogens simultaneously and each H can bond to at least one other O. So in a glass of water there's all these hydrogen bonds that are being made and broken every second. The hydrogen bond is between molecules. It's not here and here. Oh, let's get back to green. Uh, let's go here. It's not, this is the hydrogen bond here between this H and that O. The hydrogen bond is not in here and it's not in here and it's not in there and it's not in there. It's between molecules, not within molecules. All right, so now that um, finishes water. We'll talk again about water when we get to micro emergent uh, properties, but for now we have to go to adhesion and how this is also important. So adhesion allows water molecules to be attracted to other molecules that can hydrogen bond. And cells contain and are surrounded by a solution made of water's molecules and other solutes. Ionic solutes love water. In fact, sodium ions get surrounded by water because sodium's positive and water's polar that makes this ion really big and it's hard to get through cell membranes as a result. Cells compensate by building or having proteins that either pump the sodium through or form a gate to let the sodium go through. Um, in general, hydrophilic substances are substances that love water. They're polar. Salts, amino acids, alcohol, glucose are all hydrophilic and they all readily dissolve in water. Hydrophobic substances are nonpolar. They do not readily dissolve in water, and they're repelled from it. This includes fats, cholesterol, gasoline, and oils. Okay. Now, next part here, we got to talk briefly about surface area and volume. Cell size is critically controlled um, by its surface area. It turns out as a cell grows in size, eventually the surface area will not be sufficient to supply the volume inside with the necessary materials and energy. Since all materials have to pass through the cell membrane to get into the inside of the cell, the surface area of the cell membrane is kind of important. 
It turns out when the surface area to volume ratio reaches a critical low value, a cell can no longer grow in size. Um, smaller cells have a more favorable SA to V ratio than larger cells. In special areas where high gas exchange or high exchange is required, cells increase their surface area to facilitate better exchange, and that means that they'll like fold their membrane or or do something, convolute the membrane. So root hairs basically break up the surface smooth membrane of a root to increase surface area for absorption. The villi on the small intestine do the same thing to increase cellular surface. Uh, so we can so. Uh, we can absorb nutrients from the food that we eat, and cells are often not spherical because a sphere has the porous surface area to volume ratio. Cells either flatten like red blood cells or they become tubular to increase their SA uh, to V ratio. So um, I list some SA to V ratios here, but this is what's important to remember. If the, it's the graph on the right that's kind of the more important of the two graphs here. This is showing the length of the side of the cube and this is showing the surface area to volume ratio of the same cube. So if you go from a cube of side length of one, one meter, centimeter, foot, inch, doesn't matter, from zero, from near zero to one, you can see the surface area to volume ratio falls dramatically from here, from up here. So the surface area to volume ratio fell dramatically from 11 down to three as you go from a side of one to a side of two, like a, a cube that's two inches on a side. Now we've gone down more, three inches on a side going more. Th this is not survivable for a cell. Cells prefer an SA to V ratio that's as absolutely astronomical. Um, in other words, higher than 10 to survive. This is why cells are very tiny. The larger a cell gets, the more precarious its life is because the volume, which is a cubic function, is increasing faster than the surface area, which is only a square function. That's what it comes down to. I know you didn't want to hear about math, but it's all about math. The surface area to volume ratio, surface area is a square function, volume's cubic. There's a factor difference of 10. The volume increases 10 times faster than the surface area as a cell gets bigger. That's why they have to stay tiny. So there'll be questions about that on the homework, but for now I need to move to cell membranes.